Hello, my name is uh, Lucky Vingas. I'm from Turkey. Uh, I would like to ask to the Chinese delegation, just because they've been talking about the, their participation in the, to the party meeting, um, what's going to be the contribution of the wealth, because China is becoming such a strong economy, to the social needs of the rest of the world, if uh, it's been uh, one of the major players in contributing to the social needs of the rest of the world? My name is Shim Song Jun, former uh, Korean ambassador. Well, uh, this year, uh, you know, China and Korea marked uh, 25th anniversary of uh, their normalization. Uh, but as you know, because of the conflict uh, over the introduction of uh, that system by the U.S. military, not by my country, on the Korean soil, uh, well, I mean, the celebration was contracted, I mean, uh, drastically, so we didn't have uh, many events or celebrations we should have otherwise. Uh, this Tuesday, but uh, Seoul and Beijing uh, made a joint announcement to bring the third conflict or dispute to an end and to move forward to normalize their strained relations. Uh, this 11th hour agreement made prior to the arrival of U.S. President was welcomed by the seriously affected Korean business community, but made some ripples in the Korean political sector and also in Washington as well. Opposition party and the conservative media in Korea were uh, critical of the deal, insisting that the Korean government made uh, too much, I mean, unnecessary concessions or commitments of so-called three no's. No more third introduction, no trilateral security alliance among US, Japan, and South Korea, no Korea's participation in the US-led MD. As Korea and Chinese governments did not disclose the whole process of negotiations for working out uh, this agreement, I was uh, very surprised. Um, uh, the agreement came out out of blue at this time, at this particular time. Well, uh, my question what was the background? Uh, I'd like to put this uh, question uh, to the Chinese uh, panelists. Well, uh, what was the background which drove the Chinese authorities to make uh, these agreements meant at this particular time? And maybe I'd like to hear from uh, Doug Paul, my longtime friend, uh, what did you hear from Washington about uh, this agreement? Uh, although I, I read uh, National Security Advisor McMaster welcomed uh, this joint agreement. Thank you. Uh, so many questions uh, regarding China. Some uh, I can answer, some I couldn't answer. Um, the, uh, regarding the uh, uh, some issue, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, issue, maybe I can answer now. Uh, if I miss something, uh, uh, other people can uh, supplement. Uh, first of all, uh, about the free trade zone uh, in Shanghai, I guess you mentioned. Uh, that idea uh, initiated, I guess, uh, three, four years ago uh, after the uh, the, the new admi administration. I recall that time uh, Premier uh, Li Keqiang went to Shanghai and discussed. Uh, they decided to set up a free trade zone in Shanghai first. Uh, one thing uh, probably we have to keep in mind that the, the, the way of Chinese government to carry some policy, usually they want to do experiment first. That's the tradition. I, I, I'm not going to say uh, right or wrong, but that's the tradition. Just like uh, you look back uh, almost uh, 40 years ago, uh, Deng Xiaoping picked up a Shenzhen, uh, another four city as a uh, special zone. But the, uh, the interestingly, why this time choose Shanghai? 
as an experiment rather than as a place. That's something I, I guess interesting. Probably you don't know um, Deng Xiaoping uh, once made a, a such kind of remark. He said, we made a mistake. We didn't choose Shanghai as an experiment rather than uh, Shenzhen. Why he say that? That time, uh, Chinese government have no idea the experiment will be success or not. If experiment in Shanghai failed, the total economy of China will be collapsed because at that time, I guess Shanghai contribute one sixth of physical revenue to central government. So that example also indicate now Chinese government have more confidence they choose Shanghai. They think they can be successful. That's one thing. Another thing is that they, uh, it's difference between uh, free trade zone in Shanghai and uh, free trade zone in other countries. Usually free trade zone just want to uh, facilitate, facilitate trade. But in Shanghai free trade zone, they also put something in finance in that one. Uh, so in past three, four years, uh, they tried to do something like uh, uh, um, the, they call capital uh, pool uh, for a multinational company. Uh, you can uh, transfer money uh, in out freely. Uh, also, they set something, for example, make an investment for Chinese company or any company uh, headquartered in free trade zone can make overseas investment under 100 million US dollars without approval in advance. Such kind of things they have already done. So later on, central government uh, decided to promote that to now 11 uh, places, in, uh, including uh, uh, Guangzhou, uh, also even some uh, inland city. Now, in the, uh, the, 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 the National Congress, uh, Xi Jinping mentioned, based on that, they ask, uh, try to explore the possibility, as I say, free trade port. That means more uh, freely, more uh, let goods in and out. Of course, the detail have to be made later on. They, they just say, well, we want to move to this direction. The detail, we don't know. They, they some uh, government have already, uh, including Shanghai or other city like in, in Zhejiang, they have already some idea, their proposal presented to central government. The detail, we, we, we don't know. Uh, for SOE, yes, uh, that's something you made a very good question. Um, um, I mentioned in my uh, presentation, I briefly mentioned uh, SOE reform. Uh, currently, uh, what we see is uh, try to do what we call a mixed uh, shareholder uh, uh, company. That means some uh, uh, SOE sold a part of a share to private company. Uh, uh, of course, it cannot be, say, privatization, because in some cases, there's still government-owned shareholder. In some cases, not. For example, I sit in uh, one listing company as an independent director, uh, one company. Originally, uh, Shanghai government owned large share. I guess a couple of years after the, the, the 18th uh, National Congress, uh, the, the, the Shanghai government decided to sell the government share to private company. The private company own large share now. That's the uh, one case. Of course, another uh, uh, communication uh, 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 company is very large, I guess uh, third largest. They sell some share to private company like Alibaba, these kind of big things they try to get in. Maybe they expect some chemistry. They can maybe using some high technology, big data. Uh, we don't know the result. Uh, I have to admit, they do have some contradiction. Uh, these kind of things, uh, when you mention uh, more open door policy. But I, I don't know the detail. Maybe something can be resolved later on. Uh, Another thing, uh, regarding the contribution to, uh, to the social needs of the world, I, I don't mean, I don't understand what means social needs. Uh, the, 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 the gentleman raised the question. Uh, 
Um, I guess probably central the, the, the communist party tried to uh, provide some alternative choice. Uh, say, hey, uh, here is China. Uh, we do something maybe different from an uh, advanced country. Uh, so far, we are successful. Uh, I don't know whether at the end, what's the result for these kind of things. I, I'm not quite sure uh, for, for, for that. Anything? Okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, <laughs> yeah, any further question? So I, I, uh, I see none. So now it's high time for us to uh, to I respond, know uh, you know, the, uh, to the question which uh, I raised, and then uh, the question you know raised among ourselves, uh, among okay. panelists. Ambassador, Ambassador uh, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay. <laughs> sorry, I forgot it. <laughs> no Chinese. I mean, he asked Chinese first, and then maybe. <laughs> Professor uh, Jia first. No, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, I, uh, I myself don't know uh, why this time, uh, the timing. Uh, uh, but I, I guess uh, both sides uh, have uh, uh, realized after repeated uh, interactions, uh, the other side cannot give up. And also the cost of confrontation is increasing to the extent that neither side think it's worthwhile to continue. Uh, um, so uh, I think it's time to, to uh, deal with this issue uh, or to settle this issue. So both sides made some con concessions in a way. Uh, the Chinese uh, basically accept that the, the existing uh, sad uh, systems uh, can stay, uh, whereas the South, South Korean government uh, agrees that or, or promises that it will not increase, <laughs> it will not let more uh, systems be installed uh, in, in uh, on top of the these uh, systems, so uh, some kind of agreement uh, has been reached uh, in order to to uh, overcome this and and move the relationship uh, forward. Uh, I think uh, I think it's sen it's a sensible approach, uh, and uh, uh, both sides have uh, some kind of face saving uh, arrangement. You know, arrangement. I understand that the conservatives think on, on both sides probably uh, think that you know their government gives up too much. <laughs> but um, well, uh, I, I think it's good for both countries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm not the only person in this room who has, for more than a year and a half, criticized the Chinese government for pursuing what were manifestly counterproductive efforts to intimidate South Korea into giving up the THAAD system. Um, you can only look at the, popula the popular polls in South Korea and realize that China had gone from enjoying tremendous public support through its uh, implicit support for North Korea by criticism of THAAD defenses against North Korean capabilities China was systematically alienating the people of South Korea first, and secondly, applying economic sanctions against Korean businesses that further alienated the people. Now this, I, my understanding is this arises from a, a difference in, in China over how to deal with North Korea and South Korea, and some Chinese have been saying China needs to rebalance its approach, and others are saying no, the blood is thick with North Korea, and the threat from that to the Chinese own missile testing uh, and strategic weapons systems was so great that China needed to launch all out opposition. The last point has been vitiated by this agreement. 
because Thad will continue even after the agreement. So if China's main concern was Thad radars reading the missile launches, they, obviously that was not that was a false concern or it's a concern that for some reason has gone away. Um, I would t tend to contextualize this plainly more sensible uh, position by China, uh, and I'll reserve my position on the South Korean side of this ju judgment uh, for a moment. Uh, the contextualization is that in 2013-2014, Xi Jinping launched very intense reconsiderations of Chinese relationships with its neighbors. They had a thing called the Peripheral Policy Conference in late 2013 and a Foreign Policy uh, Work Conference in 14. And if you had just gone from the words in the statements and speeches at the uh, conferences, you would conclude that China realized that the competition for its future security is on the periphery of China. Uh, if the United States and other countries are concerned about Chinese behavior, they have a natural coalition of 14 land neighbors of China and three maritime neighbors, all of whom do not want to be part of the Chinese empire, do not want to be allies of China, but want to enjoy the trade and other benefits that come from being a neighbor of a growing economy like China's. And so they have very ambivalent views. And these are useful to the West, should China turn ugly in its behavior towards us or its neighbors, uh, because this, this would naturally form a coalition to resist Chinese assertiveness. On the other hand, if China can go in and persuade these countries that the balance of benefit is in good relations with China, building a coalition against China under some circumstances would be harder to do. So I think strategically it's wise for China to have sought to improve relations or normalize relations with all of its neighbors. But after the 2013 and 2014 conferences, history went a different direction. And China was in deep friction with Japan, Korea, Vietnam, India, and uh, maybe the exception was Russia in that period. Um, it strikes me as eminently sensible to conclude that now that Xi Jinping has uh, reduced his internal opposition and consolidated his power, he, wanted, he would want to return to a policy of trying to uh, mollify and win over as much of the neighborhood as he can and do this by very quickly after the 19th Party Congress, not just having an agreement on THAAD with the ROK government, but having indications of an early summit in Japan next year and working out an agreement with the Vietnamese just two days ago to manage their South China Sea disputes. So I see maybe, maybe a fire was lighted under this process by Trump's impending visit, but I see bigger forces at work Beyond that, they may be they may reinforce each other. Um, now, whether the ROK made a great deal, uh, my my ears are open. I'd like to hear. One of the problems that I've I, I was in Tokyo until a couple of days ago and I'm talking to senior people in the Japanese government, and none of them had been briefed on what was going on. Uh, Americans had not been briefed on what's going on, and the U.S. has not been briefing them on what the U.S. plans are for regional security. There's been an insufficient dialogue among allies and friends uh, to give us a sense of, of uh, the value of these uh, developments, but I think they're really eye-catching developments and bear close watching. Um, I had some uh, personal observation on the uh, issue. Uh, I'm not expert on this area, but as the average Chinese people, uh, we, I paid attention on the relation with South Korea. Uh, probably uh, President Park know that uh, we privately uh, talk a couple times on, on previous uh, situation uh, between South Korea and China. Uh, I don't feel happy with that previous uh, situation. Uh, also, uh, in some way, uh, what the Chinese government or part of that, uh, what they are doing not perfect. In, 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 in many ways, uh, why they pick some uh, South Korea company operating in China. I, I don't think any reason to do that. But uh, if I look uh, forward, the, 
the results of negotiation, I guess, is a, a positive. At least, not both sides, even including U.S. or Japan, can, con can concentrate to deal with the North Korea nuclear uh, issue. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's very hard. Uh, each side is suspicion, what's the uh, motivation uh, uh, for the proposal or whatever, uh, another side. So I, I look at the, the, the positive. Another thing is I will add, um, people here always say is a learning curve. I guess in some way Chinese uh, leader also on the learning curve. At the beginning, uh, she took over, deal with the Diao uh, Yudao, uh, the Asian. Maybe he is a very strong. Now it's a kind of learn more uh, experience. I guess maybe we should have a kind of uh, open position uh, to consider that. As for the presentation of uh, Japanese uh, panelists, you uh, very good summarize uh, two track uh, strategy of Japanese to deal with China. Also, as an average Chinese people, I read the news. I'm, I'm a quite a, I don't understand. I, I, I do feel fundamental contradiction, these two tracks. On the one hand, you openly, publicly say, we want to set Asia security uh, diamond. Openly want US, India, Australia get together, contain China. On the other hand, you say, hey, we want to update the level a relation with China, unless Chinese leaders are really stupid. Otherwise, how they can do that? You privately do that on the table, fine. You openly, publicly, at the one hand. On the other hand, hey, we want a good relation with you. <coughs> I don't understand how you can work that way. No, no we can work that way. Uh, that's, uh, I'm not professional on uh, international relation. I just, but I, I read, I'm very interested on this issue, uh, so that's my uh, comment. Okay. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Minister Kope uh, for your some uh, additional comment on the uh, future of the uh, Silk Road project. You know, there are many, uh, uh, not many, but some uh, counter argument uh, on the feasibility of the uh, one belt one load, uh, you know, project because you know this, uh, it uh, entails huge, uh, you know, uh, financial resource, and there's some uh, security issues uh, involved in. Then uh, how we could uh, uh, secure sustainable, uh, you know, the income, you know, the business model. So maybe uh, you might have some uh, your comment. Well, first of all, um, we need a strategic vision. We have it. Um, there is a framework, and we all of us know exactly what can be our own roadmap in order to align the interest of everybody. So now the second step, as you were saying, is to see if it's um, financially sustainable. Uh, there are many interrogations, of course, and uh, it wouldn't be serious to say today that we have all the answers. But by having a little experience about the past, we know that growth generates growth, activity generates activity. And so if we are able to develop partnerships, to uh, set uh, the question of protectionism and reciprocity on trade, I think we have some opportunities to develop activity. On the question of the uh, um, of, of um, the way we can financially sustain this project. Um, we know that we need private funds. It's not possible to imagine only public funds when you, we know all of us the high level of public debt and the fact that it's not possible. But we have to use public funds as uh, leverage. It's the only way we can um, uh, implement um, uh, some in incentives for the, to, for the private projects. When you see, for instance, the success of the Juncker plan for the European investment, you can imagine that we can develop this kind of opportunities in the whole uh, layout of the, uh, 
Silk Road. But of course we have lots to do and I think this will be the next step. But my opinion is that Europeans today can bring their own uh, contribution to it. Thank you. Uh, can I invite uh, Professor uh, Hosoya for any comment? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to combine a question by Ambassador Park and also a question by Shao. Uh, Professor Shao, about Japanese intention to create uh, some sort of regional cooperation. One thing is that, uh, well, this is not, uh, I think, a Japanese invention. I think that the, in the beginning, President Xi Jinping said that, uh, reportedly said that uh, in his uh, summit meeting with President Obama that the Pacific Ocean is large enough uh, to be divided by two great powers, the United States and China. And basically, I think that the BRI, One Belt Run Road initiative is try to avoid the confrontation with the United States by marching westward, not eastward. If China is marching westward, of course, there are Japan and South Korea and the United States. Eastward. Eastward. Yes, eastward. But if China is marching westward, uh, we can see a sort of a power vacuum because the United States is retreating from Afghanistan and Central Asia. That's why, if we see the power vacuum after the dissolve of the dissolution of the dissolve of the Soviet Union, of course, Russian influence has been declined. That's why it's much uh, safer, I think, for China to expand in that direction rather than to the direction where Japan and the South Korea are there and where uh, American security commitments are there. So in that sense, I think that uh, it is a quite wise strategy, for, wise strategy for China to try to expand in the direction and try to uh, coexist in the Pacific Ocean together with the United States. And also one more thing is that uh, that initiative, Prime Minister Abe's regional vision was originally criticized by Chinese officials. That's why Prime Minister Abe, uh, after that, they stopped to stop talking about the vision. But recently, in the last one year or so, both Indian officials and the experts and the Australian officials and the uh, experts are much more interested in promoting this idea because they fear more assertive Chinese foreign policy and they fear the future of American commitment in this region. To try to involve the United States in this region. I think that uh, the two countries, Australia, two allies, security allies of the United States, Australia and India, uh, are trying to ask the Japanese government to promote once again this idea. So I think that this does not contradict to the recent Chinese policy, which means that China is expanding westward, but at the same time, in the longer term, I think that uh, having seen the recent a speech by President Xi Jinping. China is in the long term trying to become the number one country, number one great power in the world. It means that there will be some vacuum in East Asia as well. Then there will be power vacuum after United States retreat in some way from the region in some way under President Trump. I think that China is more interested in expanding in that direction. In that way, I think that original one by one old in initiative can expand in a longer term in the direction in East Asia as well. Then I think China uh, would be trying to replace, in some way, American leadership role in, the, in this region. Do you have anything to, to add? Mm. Please. I think that. Um, contradictions are in the eye of the beholder. And I actually didn't see any contradiction in uh, the presentation of Japanese policy, except I don't like metaphors. And the idea of a diamond uh, puts me off. <laughs> but the idea of security cooperation among four countries, that I find natural. Now, the, of the four modernizations of Deng Xiaoping, Number four was modernization of the PLA. China is, by its own declaration and interpretation of history, a peaceful nation. And um, why was the China modernizing the PLA? 
Well, the rationale was initially defensive, although the most recent action which prompted that was an invasion of Vietnam in 1979, and that's a, a story of its own. But then China went beyond purely defensive weapons in the PLA and adopted weapons that can only be described as offensive. Now that is, but by global standards, PLA was way behind the times. So is that a contradiction? Well, in one respect, yes, and in the other respect, no. So uh, these contradictions, as, as I say, are in the eyes of the beholder, and the question is how countries handle their various, often sometimes conflict, conflicting or partially conflicting objectives. So anyway, I didn't see the contradiction, but I, and, and similarly, I'd, I had no problem with modernizing the PLA, at least up to a certain point. Uh, it seems to have gone beyond that point in my uh, judgment, given Chinese declaratory policy. Uh, we have uh, three to five minutes. So I'd like to give some uh, common question to uh, Doug and uh, Professor uh, Jia Um That is, um, uh, your comment on uh, possibility and the feasibility of uh, Henry Kissinger's, you know, uh, grand bargaining uh, ideas, you know, uh, here and there we could have some similar uh, implication uh, from China and the United States. So um, I think there will be no official position, but I'd like to ask your personal uh, comment on these two these issues. Hi. Do. Uh, say again what the issue is. Uh, comment uh, on the feasibility of the Henry Kissinger's uh, suggestion yeah, 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 on, yeah. on the name of the grand bargaining. So the, the content is as follows. If North Korean nuclear issue has been uh, resolved, then uh, North, uh, U.S. could uh, consider the withdrawal of the U.S. Uh, uh, ground forces from Korea. Uh, to uh, that is big deals, you know, the uh, contents. So maybe. So this is concerning the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But great bargaining because it is, uh, you know, uh, there should be some great uh, negotiation between South Korea, China, and uh, United States, not uh, North Korea. I think a lot of what um, Kissinger stirred up in his discussion of the grand bargain, um, well, first, people think he's very close to Trump and therefore it might be consequential. Um, but as he will tell you in private, uh, I have no influence on that man. He can't pay attention to anything for 20 seconds, let alone make a policy. So I, I think that fear is misplaced. Secondly, I think um, uh, Kissinger could have spent more time, and he's always been bad at this, at considering what allies and friends would think about hearing ideas like this without first being consulted on that. The idea of passing Japan or passing Korea and China first has, has been a source of irritation among our friends and allies in the region for a long time because he tends to go leap over them and go right to China where power resides. Having said that, now that Xi Jinping is through a point of transition with a great deal more authority, and therefore the ability to put aside pesky minor arguments and look at the big picture, uh, I think the U.S. should be proposing big ideas, which first must be carefully vetted with our allies on how we can respect each other's concerns. It's entirely theoretically po possible, and whether materially possible remains to be tested, that the U.S. could offer different kinds of radars to support effective THAAD defenses against North Korea. Or at another level of development, if North Korea no longer has a threatening capability, uh, then the United States and South Korea might agree that the U.S. footprint in South Korea could be very different, or our patterns of exercises could be considerably changed, downsized, uh, narrowed, 
um, you know, reducing tensions generally in the region. That's what I think of as that kind of grand bargain. But implicit in the conversation with China or North Korea or both would be an understanding that in the absence of progress on those threats to South Korea and the United States, that we have every right and intention to do the things I outlined in my opening remarks, which is more missiles, more nuclear weapons, and other kinds of capabilities to defend ourselves legitimately against the North Korean threat. I think uh, uh, it's conceivable that uh, you know, if North Korea gives up nuclear weapons, then uh, uh, you know the U.S. government may think about uh, withdrawing American troops from South uh, South Korea, uh, but not completely. Uh, probably, it would uh, withdraw most of the. American forces from South Korea. <laughs> Actually, at the end of the Cold War, uh, the idea was seriously entertained. Uh, um, the reason that it would leave a few Americans in, uh, in South Korea uh, after the threat is gone is uh, the, the need to maintain uh, you know, stationing troops in Japan. Okay. If if the U.S. completely withdraw forces from South Korea, then the Japanese may demand the U.S. to leave too, American soldiers to leave too. That's a that will become a big problem. You know, <laughs> so 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 I think there is a kind of a political interaction. <laughs> Uh, there, so uh, I, I think probably the U.S. would <laughs> can make the deal, but then on, but but then uh, with some kind of a variation <laughs> uh, to make sure that uh, it's uh, uh, probably China probably would not demand to the extent uh, with complete withdrawal either, uh, considering uh, the utility of uh, U.S. Uh, troops stationed in Japan. Uh, as far as China is concerned, okay. Um, so I don't know. I, I think there are uh, there are nuanced uh, uh, discussions uh, uh, to be held uh, to to sort out this kind of issue. Yeah, thank you. I'm um, like Zhao. I'm an economist, and I just am on the fringes of these areas, uh, but I try to pay attention. And uh, I found the Chinese argument against THAAD with focus on the radars simply baffling. We have satellites these days, and we heard at this meeting about the new European Galileo and how many satellites are going to be up and the resolution that they provide, which is a square meter which is just amazing, actually, but that's been the evolution of technology from satellites. And I do, don't understand what the, this must get into highly sensitive issues, which I'm not qualified to understand, but I don't understand what the radar could produce that satellites these days, not 20 years ago, but these days, can produce. So my interpretation of the Chinese action, given that view, which may be incorrect, uh, was that this was a deliberate provocation by the Chinese government to South Korea. And then the question is, why would they do that? And I've seen them do that with respect to J Japan from time to time, but that has an entirely different history. But, um, and, uh, but again, to me, this heavy emphasis both to the U.S. and to, especially to South Korea on the compromising of Chinese uh, security by the radar I just found baffling with today's, today's technology, leave aside the technology of the next 10 years. Just found it baffling. And so maybe there's something I don't know, but there may be something that the PLA also doesn't know <laughs> that they should know. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, some Chinese experts argue uh, that uh, you know uh, the that radar system 
can do much more than the uh, satellites in terms of uh, identifying the the location uh, of uh, Chinese uh, intercontinental missiles, uh, so-called strategic uh, assets. Uh, so they th that's their argument. And then later on, uh, you know, there are different arguments uh, to to both. Uh, to bolster the, the, the position uh, on, on that. That is, uh, the SAS system could be used uh, as a way to integrate the South Korea into this uh, theater missile defense on the part of the uh, US against. Again, so the SAS system may be the, uh, the way to, uh, I mean, uh, deploying the SAS system may be a way to integrate the South Korea to get South Korea into this theater missile defense arrangement on the part of uh, the U.S. Uh, and uh, and uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, the so-called theater missile defense is not against uh, you know the Chinese have always believed that it's not just against North Korea it's against China the primary purpose is against China so. Uh, so later on, the Chinese were saying that the SAS, you know, when, when the Americans and South Koreans wanted to, came, to come to Beijing to explain to the Chinese why the SAS system uh, radar does not pose a serious threat to uh, China's uh, limited uh, strategic capabilities to destabilize the, 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 the relationship, uh, the Chinese rejected saying that this is, a, this is no longer a technical issue, it's a strategic issue. Uh, uh, so it was against this contest. But of course, it's the, the, probably the reality is even more complicated. Uh, I'm not going to say that. Yeah, well, we may need a whole night for to complete this discussion. So uh, it's high time for me to end uh, this uh, discussion on uh, China. Maybe if I just one uh, words, uh, what, uh, one sentence, you know, the, uh, the closing uh, uh, remarks is, will be uh, as follows. Maybe we hope, I mean, international community expect China will uh, play more responsible and more constructive leading role, you know, in shaping a uh, new world uh, in, uh, to achieve peace and prosperity. So that is our conclusion. Thanks so much for your <laughs> assistance.